So, okay. Um, right. So today, one of the topics we're going to talk about is uh, networking. And actually, you may take it the way or not. It actually, oh, it looks good, I think. As long as you guys can read, the contrast should be high enough. Um, it fits quite well with sensors, right? Because if you think about a mobile device, in a way, right, what does it actually do? Well, it's, it's like a mobile processor in the widest sense. And of course, it has some sensors that, you know, sense the external environment. And if we think about it as an agent on its own right, and that's every time we talk about something being smart, we ascribe it intelligence to some extent, that it does something for us automatically. Well, if something senses something, it also needs to be able to act on that, right? So by, usually we have some sort of actuators that would be, you know, in, in robotics with motors or the like. Uh, in, in, in the smartphone world, that's of course something else that would be, you know, like, what would be actuators on the mobile phone? The built-in ones. What can we use to signal something on the new mobile phone? Speakers, yeah, what else? Sound. Yeah, sound, yeah. Other options? Vibration. Yeah, cool, yeah, what else? The screen? Yep, the screen, and yeah, and there's one tiny other element that they usually all have on the phone. You don't need permission to access it, generally. The LED for, like, blinking stuff. Yeah. Right? So you can use that as well for notifications and so on, right? So it goes in line with the vibration kind of thing. So, of course, you know, the extent to which you communicate something doing this, right, to the user, it varies, right? It's situational dependent, right? Only gives you much more options in a way, screen even more. Uh, uh, but, you know, even vibration can be very sensible, and sometimes just the blinking will be helpful. If you get up in the morning, you know your phone blink, then you kind of know, okay, something has happened, but you, I don't need to know more details, right? Mm -hmm. So that's sometimes uh, the kind of indicator of whether or not something happens. And if you think about it, complementary to the you know, uh, sensing of the environment and acting in, in the environment, you as the environment, well, one of the obvious things that are similar to sensors, but actually like two-way sensors, uh, is basically communication, right? Where we send something out, and usually get something back in a way, right? So it complements this acting on the environment quite well, but usually into a different dimension, right? To you interacting with web services, calendars, uh, you know, uh, your service in the widest sense, um, as opposed to the user. So it's more centered towards the network, but fundamentally it's quite related uh, in, in, in its functionality. So kind of sensing and networking kind of belongs together. Uh, and you'll find that in many forward applications, if you think about uh, map-based navigation, of course, you rely on some sort of communication channel uh, on the one hand, but of course also on sensors on the device, right, that are more like passively uh, receiving your location and acting on this. So, um, and we haven't, I think many of you have suffered through a bit of networking on Android already. <laughs> the ones that did the RFC, uh, sorry, the, um, the, the, the um, RSS feed, right? So passing, you probably found that the networking is not necessarily super intuitive. Well, so, you know, there's a bit of a learning momentum there. Um, and of course, we got, get to talk to about, the, about this, but other than just conventional networking, um, there's of course a much, much wider range of different uh, functionalities that specifically um, smartphones offer, right? So if we talk about networking, we, it's easy to, to just think about uh, classical Ethernet or LAN-based interaction, right? But actually if you, yeah, that's, that's a bit stretched here, so I'm, I'm, I'm to be blamed, but the idea is that a networking is uh, a much more, um, uh, you know, holistic concept in a, from a technological viewpoint because it extends both from communicating on nano level, right, so having individual uh, small devices uh, interact on very close distances with very limited power opportunities and, you know, um, for example, if they are supposed to uh, um, be injected into biological entities for tracking for individuals or interaction be within individuals and so on. Um, but also, of course, very wide range uh, kind of concepts like the classical one, the wide area network, right? Which we kind of equate with the internet li li vastly or largely. Um, so we need to bear in mind there are different kind of scopes of networking. We need to be sure which ones we're talking about. And other, uh, or different from most other courses and specifically the, um, um, you know, for example, cloud course, we, we mostly concentrated on uh, what kind of spatial scope? You all did cloud computing? What were we mostly thinking about or worrying about? 
which which scope? Did we work more on the you know kind of what scale? Did we work on uh, a local internet scale, or did we? Move beyond this. Work in the internet as a whole, right? Primarily, right? So the idea is that if you expose something on AWS, unfortunately, you can't just think about your environment, the people in your room, that maybe your potential, you know, attackers or whatever else. But actually, you need to think about anyone, right? Globally. So it kind of is a matter of scope. And this here kind of delineates the scope from wide area network to um, what was that one here? The second one. I can't even read this thing. Sorry for that. That's on me. Um, Uh, I don't know. So, uh, and then this one is the metropolitan area network. They have campus area network and so on. Uh, local area networks, as you guys know, right? The convention we think about. What's PAN? For what? Personal. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, what, what, to what extent do you think that it's you know reaches? So yeah, uh, the idea is more that this moves into a bit of the world towards the mobile space where it actually surrounds uh, you to some extent, right? So the area network that is relevant to you, if you bring your laptop, of course, or your devices along, you should maintain connectivity or interaction with the, with, you know, the relevant environment in that scope, right? So, uh, so there's mobility aspect in there. And then even, even, even stronger, this one here, BAN, did anyone hear about it? You can't read it, it's B-A-N. Sorry for that. Body area network. So it's getting more immediate, right? So it's even closer. It's not only in the surrounding anymore, it's really literally on my body, right? And um, the reason why we differentiate between those, of course, uh, is because there are different use cases and demands, right? So for example, latency requirements for metrics along the body are probably way, way higher, but even worse so, um, our ability to, we're talking about mobility, our ability to uh, have power at our avail is very limited, right? So smartphones, we, we know it right there. The telephones used to last half a week, nowadays they last one day, if we're lucky. So, and you know, and if you think about census communication and so on, uh, then we need to think about power in a different way than we need to think about it uh, on, on higher level networking concepts, right? And here, for example, throughput is much more decisive. In this case, it's just the fact that we are connected that's interesting, right? So that we can actually uh, send, uh, 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 you know, get, get some biometric in, um, measures and collect them and so on. Um, and can facilitate this using some sort of networking technology. So there, um, that's why I'm not only talking about, okay, how do I get stuff off the internet so you can solve your RSS feed problem, but actually more wider, okay, what different kind of uh, networking uh, interaction options do you have on Android? Some of them anyway, in fact, very few of them, but I think some of the more perhaps interesting ones, uh, including the ones that are relevant to you, of course. And um, one area that's sitting kind of between the body area network and certainly above the nano area network, which would be uh, yeah, um, a, a bit of a um, narrow conception, it would be NFC, for example, right? Near field communication, you guys have come across that. Yeah. Who has used that in practice? Ah, oh, cool. When you NFC, when you pay stuff, you can use your phone uh, yeah. as a credit card and it uses NFC to pay. Cool, yeah, anyone else? Um, that's right. So for that's kind of the hot application for it, right? Uh, Google Pay, Apple Pay, all those, right? So they're kind of coming out of the trenches and uh, kind of figuring out if, if we can actually put it into practice. And they are not the first ones at all, right? So they have been long lasting. I think BlackBerry was way earlier. Uh, does anyone remember BlackBerry or know what BlackBerry? Yeah, somewhere, right? You you heard it when it came down, right? So uh, yeah. it's basically at the at the end of it. It was very hot in the mid two thousands as a kind of corporate. Communication solutions that integrated the backend servers with uh, mobile, fo you know, with smartphones. With and the characteristic of them is that they all had keywords, like fully fledged keywords. Um, but anyway, so they were largely overtaken when the iPhone came out and then Android subsequently. But they were quite, quite, quite um, uh, ahead with the whole concept. But of course, they didn't capture the consumer market because they were more focused on the business uh, corporate context. So. NFC, and of course we have wireless LAN and wireless sense or networking as you know it, uh, which we also briefly discussed, no, we discuss it as well. But I think this is something uh, I will give you rather some pointers to and you'll be able to figure it out quite, quite straightforward. Uh, whereas NFC, I think we, it's probably interesting to get a bit of a um, background. Um, at least I think it's sensible to talk about because we, 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 you guys will use it. You know, you won't have a chance to decide whether or not you kind of will use it in, this, in the future. 
But so then it's kind of sensible to think about what this is actually, and how can I program against it? How can I use it, right? So how does it work? Does anyone know? Yeah, and there's another technology that sounds that has seemingly similar functionality. That was a bit more earlier, like you know, ten years ago, everyone's talking about that stuff. NFC is kind of a bit of a hot recent thing. No. Anyone here of RFID before? No, RFID. What does RFID stand for? Is anyone? <coughs> or what was the purpose? Well, RFID is, um, if we talk about NFC, we kind of need to backtrack and talk about RFID first because it's pretty much the, well, actually it's the parent standard, right? Because if we want to understand one, we probably need to understand the other, and so you can relate them. So if people talk about one thing or the other thing, you can differentiate um, because both of them will be relevant or remain relevant, even though on the consumer side, we'll mostly deal with NFC, of course, right? But depending on your future endeavors, that may well be um, slightly different. So RFID is um, the, the, um, yeah, short for radio frequency identification. And the main purpose was simply to, well, identify individuals unambiguously and wirelessly, right? So, you know, by having the, in Norway auto pass, for example, right? So you want to, um, uh, you know, no, you don't want to, but you have to pay on toll roads. So uh, in order to do that, right, you can either do that by them taking pictures of you and sending you emails, uh, sorry, sending you your uh, invoices, or if you want to manage easier, you have this auto pass tag thing in your car, right? So and it basically registers every time you pass a, a, a toll booth or gate, I guess is the term here. Um, and then, you know, they collate and send you um, the, 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 the invoices conveniently. So, and this was indeed one of the, well, it's the second kind of um, application um, of uh, IFRD originally, in, even in 1973. So we need to, you know, Norway is hot and current and, you know, we have the latest tech here. But 1973, that is like serious, right? So in 1973, it actually came out in New York as a kind of prototype for uh, managing and paying on toll roads, right? So it's by no means a, you know, uh, uh, you know millennium style um, technology in a way. So, um, but of course at that time, it didn't really operate based on uh, ra radio frequency per se, but actually used sound and light, right? So it was some, some light emitting uh, mechanisms or, or, or sound mechanisms to facilitate this. And even earlier, similar light mecha mechanisms, audio specifically, have been used for spying uh, in yeah, 1945. In fact, that's a um, um, Soviet Union era kind of uh, uh, in invention in a widest sense, but it only worked based on audio, right? So the second uh, iteration included light um, in, um, operation as well, because they realized if you use cars, well, you know, sound is not the, op you know, the, 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 the best possible means of transporting information. And then in uh, 83, the first patent came out in a way, um, and that was kind of the predecessor of the modern radio wave based uh, IFID, the one we kind of think about, um, and that has found introduction into um, various application areas. So what's the principle? Well, it's about, about identifying, number one. Number two, there's this thing about being active or passive. So basically, um, the idea is um, you want to ensure that the identification is reliable and should ideally work without um, external power sources, particularly on the you know, tag side, right? So, um, because if you have the auto pass thing, I'm not sure, is it actually passive or active? I think it's passive, right? It doesn't have any uh, power support uh, in, in itself, right? So otherwise, it would be pretty inconvenient if you, you know, only can, um, you know, use it every two months. You need to recharge the battery or something like this, but you want to use it persistently. So the idea is that we can have a concept of passive tags that don't need to be powered, but nevertheless work, right? So um, and the other aspect, of course, is um, the technology should have dealt with very um, distances, right? So reaching from very close distances, like 10 centimeters to all the like to ranges of up to 200 meters, which is considerable if you think about it, right? So if you think about uh, uh, um, 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 identification technology working on that distance, that's seriously creepy, because any, you know, any drive-by would be unproblematic. So um, how do they actually look like, those tags? You may actually have seen or found them at times or somewhere, perhaps even in your clothes. Um, that's a classical setup. Most of the space is wasted for um, antenna technology, right? So, because that's the key thing. Uh, and you will appreciate in a second why the antenna needs to be so large. Why does the antenna need to be so large? <laughs> I 
One of the more mature students, perhaps? <laughs> no? All right, we get to that. So we have the antenna, we have the chip, and this whole thing cons you know, is, is the RFID tag. So, and we see this chip is really minimal, right? So you waste a lot of space just on your antenna, and they come in various shapes and sizes. So why is the antenna so large? Probably. Because there is no power supply? Oh, there's no power supply, right. So what, why does the antenna help you then? What's then the actual use of the antenna? Is it just receiving and sending data? But what else? I like those kind of students. Come on, let's. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Please. Yeah, this is a wild guess, but uh, yeah. it looks like a coil. It yeah. like generates an electricity. Yeah. Yeah. There yeah. you go. Right. So, what did we learn in physics about this? What's <laughs> the concept? If you have a magnet over the thing, like you'll generate. Induction or whatever? Correct, right? So induction, that's the induction principle. That's precisely the purpose of it. Yeah, it's yeah, very correct, right? So the idea is basically that you have some, some um, active um, reader, if you like, um, that actually uh, produces or creates an electromagnetic magnetic field that is in range, within range to the uh, actual, you know, transponder, the, 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 the passive um, party in this game, of course, there could be two active ones as well, then it would be, you know, not much um, uh, challenge there. But the idea is that it actually activates the uh, electromagnetic magnetic field uh, through the antenna of the passive tag, and thereby activates the chip, and actually what it simply does, transmits blindly the information it actually has. No authentication, no magic, it's just transmitting whatever payload it's supposed to transmit. That's why the principle of simply identification, right? So unique identifier. That's it, no magic, right? You, you just don't per se store data. You can, of course, but the uh, use case is generally that kind of thing, right? So kind of drive by, create electromagnetic field, um, transponder is activated, briefly sends the information, you leave the field, and then it's deactivated again. But no mean needs of power uh, on that um, passive party side, right? So induction is the principle uh, by, this, by which this is basically um, Empowered, so the active party activates the deactivated party. So it's kind of you know if you look at it now, ah, cool, yeah, that makes sense, right? So it also makes sense that it only works on limited distances, of course, right? Because you need to have a sufficiently strong field or weak field to actually activate those um, those those um, tags. And the application areas, um, some of them you 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 may be quite familiar with, but of course the obvious one was target systems, right? Um, Inventory management or in libraries, so it was a really, really, really hot. Um, if you were to write a your master's, or uh, yeah, uh, I guess whatever, any thesis in the uh, end '90s and so on, people or early 2000s people were thinking about that quite a lot. You know, writing inventory systems, library management systems uh, with RFID technology because it's kind of think think about it, it's really beautiful, right? So you, you have the books all in there. You are basically riding through the library or walking through the library with some sort of transponder or reader. Uh, and uh, you figure out which books are missing, right? And where they are in the first place, right? Just imagine the classic case, oh, this book is missing, you know, you go to the library and telling, sorry guys, I'm, I'm, I'm missing this book, uh, uh, can you figure out where it is? Or think about stock counting, companies close one day to do that kind of stuff. If you have sufficiently large items, you know, um, that in, in retail or so on, that you actually sell close, as an example, stock inventory management becomes a no-brainer, right? At least for those items that are identified this way, because you immediately know the stock. Let alone, of course, any, you know, the related uh, benefits with respect to security, right? So you can actually uh, identify whether it's a pass-through of clothes. There was a big discussion as well on privacy at that time, because when uh, clothes were started to be identified with tags, the question was, well, when you leave your, you know, your store and you're actually you know, wearing your clothes, will you be perpetually be able to be identified by other stores by just walking in, right? Because it's basically a passive RFID tag, which is doesn't have any authentication, any security, it just sends blindly every time the payload it has to any transponder, right? So the obvious solution was to destroy the RFID tag every time you buy the item, right? So only uh, uh, the active RFID tags would leave the store, therefore this process wouldn't happen. But you never know, right? So, uh, so if you think about it, there's some possible creepy applications that could arise from this kind of uh, tag, right? Here, supply chain management, big thing, right? Um, quality assurance. If you send an item, so traditionally when you managed items, you were thinking about um, um, identifying in batches, right? So um, that's classically done with drinks, for example. Coca-Cola, when they produce uh, a batch of Coke uh, cans and so on, they are, they are, they are identify them uh, by batch level because they don't have 
the, um, they, they will not waste the time of applying serial numbers individual to code cans, but actually consider them batches. And if one of them goes bad, they can actually track it, trace it back to that very day or that week of production in that particular site to figure out where you know, the bacteria came into the drink. That's on the stream shit. Anyway, it's not a claim, it's just the hypothesis. Let's say any you know, uh, fuzzy drink, uh, uh, fizzy drink company that could have that issue, right? So there's Pepsi as well. So, um, but <laughs> point is, um, using this mechanism, of course, makes it a lot easier, right? If you have high price items, think about industrial uh, level items, of course, um, but even smaller scale technology items and so on, it's so much easier to track them back individually and they don't even need to think about batches anymore, right? So you kind of, you can even rethink your supply chain management quite a bit and uh, your, your data associated with this because you can simply go back into a retail store, figure out the ID of this particular item uh, based on the RFID tag and it can tell you which pathway it actually took through the entire chain and you know where potential issues could have happened, right? So uh, yeah, the more obvious cases, excess control. So, and at this stage, um, if I asked you again, how many of you have used RFID before? What would be your answer? Yeah, anyone else? Good. You have tech cards to get into rooms here, right? How many of you use them? Everyone, right? So you kind of use RFID. So, you know, you're actually using it, right? So I'm not sure what, what tech is behind it. Is it NFC specifically or is it uh, a different proprietary? RFID tech. Good one, right? I don't know. We can I figure it out. I, I suspect it's just a normal NFC. Okay. Yeah. But anyway, so, but in any case, we are using actively RFID technology, right? So it's very common nowadays already for access control. We know it, of course, and simulate personnel tracking if you have those gates and so on. Big creepy. Um, lucky we don't have that yet. Perhaps we do, I don't know. But anyway, um, so um, generally. So there's a lot of. Uh, ranges for applications of, uh, that you can think about, right? So both in an, in an industrial context, retail context, but also in a in a in a uh, HR context that are uh, kind of relevant, and they come in various shapes and sizes, right? So very small ones that cost a few cents in a row, or unique, uh, uniquely identifiable by uh, 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 um, writing identifiers um, to them and so on, and all different shapes as well, right? So for example, books. Um, those would be more suitable, for example, for DVDs, right? So they don't um, uh, create an, um, um, uh, uh, how do you say, um, you know, so they, 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 their rotational um, speed is not affected, right? So the balance is not affected of the, uh, those ones, uh, and so on. So you, you can apply it to different kind of concepts. Uh, books, for example, find those kind of IFRDs quite, um, quite commonly. Um, so yeah, so different forms and sizes uh, that are available. The problem is with RFID that it's not one single thing. Yeah? It's a set of standards or different uh, um, specifications um, that are all under one umbrella. So they have been uh, ISO, specify, uh, ISO um, certified, um, I think in the mid 90s or something like this. I uh, would need to look it up again, but quite some time ago in fact. And they have different uh, subcategories, right? So we have a uh, the lower range is up to 10 centimeters, um, which of course are very low data speeds. Then we have uh, up to one meter, which are considerably higher, and they all work on different bandwidths, right? So um, it's quite quite relevant when to know because um, the question is here: most of those uh, bands are actually reserved for different specific purposes, right? So most commonly, if you think about you want to do have an industrial application. You need to be very wary about the ISM bed. What is that thing? ISM? So it's currently used for industrial security or medical um, devices. So it's reserved for that purpose. So if you muck around that area, you need to be very, very cautious that uh, you know um, you, you you may actually. Um, interact or interfere with those devices, right? That's why the, the string, string concern about, you know, there was always this issue with using telephones in hospitals kind of thing, right? Especially Wi-Fi capability. Like in planes, it has been, yeah, whatever, you know, soft enough and people, I think, have enough empirical evidence that we apparently don't really interact with the navigation system of the airplane. So in the meantime, we can largely use phones on planes, right? But that's kind of, that's where this very uh, rigid security transition um, uh, protocols come from to, to limit our use of those uh, transmission technologies. But if you find, um, so if you look at it carefully, of course, you have extension in ranges. 
you have extension and data speeds and so on, and of course different forms of applications uh, associated with this, but most importantly is the fact that they're regulated or not. And you find that applications up to 10 centimeters, distance 10 centimeters, are inherently unregulated. And that, of course, makes it very attractive, right? So if you think about, because when we talk about technology, a uh, uh, considerable part of the cost that we usually expend is related to uh, certification, regulation, and compliance. Right? It's not so much the tech itself, right? But the fact that you can produce those uh, techs relatively cheaply most likely uh, correlates with the fact that you're actually in this range there. That it's really uh, cheap to um, um, produce, uh, um, you know, identifiers that work in this particular uh, level. So, and this brings us to NFC in the widest sense. So now RFID is the big picture. That's basically any uh, radio frequency transmission technology for the purpose of unique identification. But if we uh, look at this um, uh, more narrowly, well, you know, it seems here, this seems to be the interesting bit, especially for our purposes. First of all, it's somewhat privacy preserving by limiting it to 10 centimeters. It's unregulated, making it cheap. Low data rates, and that's mostly sensible and sufficient for our purposes, which means just we want to, you know, um, transmit um, simple data, um, or perhaps even only simple strings. Um, so th that's why um, NFC has kind of crystallized out of this one as a um, kind of industry standard de facto for consumer-based communication. Please. Uh, how, come, how come the data speed gets faster the further the range is? Well, you use more power implicitly, right? Okay. So basically, by in, having uh, having a stronger stronger electromagnetic fields, they can transmit more energy. <laughs> basically, but that's that's a nice one, though. As well, actually, spot on. I should have mentioned that one. Um, of course, since since we're using more 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 range comes with more power, it also implies more battery consumption, right? So having those kind of uh, we we know that wireless LAN, for example, is reasonably expensive to um, um, well in that band. Um, with, the, with the necessary power uh, of two point in the uh, 2.4 gigahertz band is kind of expensive to run, right? So you want to avoid this where possible on your, on your mobile phone. By the way, we get to that uh, later, but uh, I, I'm sorry. Uh, NFC actually minimizes that need, right? So by actually focusing on short distance, very low price and antenna um, and also no p low power consumption that's uh, of course um, implied. So um, <coughs> This thing also has been around for a while. Again, starting off with a parent experience here in 1983, first patent for RFID, and that's where the substandards came about, basically. That's kind of considered the starting point of uh, NFC as it is. In 97, there was the, f the first use of that one. And uh, in 2003, there you go, it became a uh, standard in its own right, an ISO standard. And that's really important because at that time, suddenly it became sensible um, to use it because it would, of course, work across devices. Right, if everyone commits to that standard. So uh, the, 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 the grounds for actually using it uh, practically on a consumer level with a you know, fragmented um, device scape um, became sensible here. So first Android news, since we're talking Android, was in 2010 uh, on the Samsung flagship at that time, the Nexus S, had NFC tech uh, involved. And uh, in the past few years, past three, four years, um, became increasingly common to think about payment solutions for that one, right? So there were a lot of priors that kind of were, were removed again, but I think Apple Pay and Google Pay are here to stay. That was a rhyme. Anyway, um, so um, that's, that's definitely something we're dealing with uh, in the longer term. And this whole thing is kind of, or the standard is largely managed by the NFC forum, which is basically an industrial consortium or industrial interest forum in the widest sense. So the manufacturers actually pair, come together and decide what the standards is, um, how the um, exchange protocols are for uh, for those um, for those tags and so on. So you can use it with um, devices across different manufacturers. So in I think it's sufficiently clear that they have realized it doesn't really make sense to um, other than Apple to to um, you know limit your market and your the the openness to um, a specific device and so on. So the idea is that there's an open standardization. So it leads us, um, well, the principles up to 10 centimeters and up to, to uh, 424 kilobit per second. Duplex communication, that's quite cool. What's duplex? You guys know that, right? Duplex? No. So it's basically if you can communicate in both directions at the same time, right? So. Um, 
that's um, th that's the idea, right? So if, if you can only uh, transmit in one direction, uh, then of course uh, you, you have limited ability to. Um, uh, well, the, the data transfer goes considerably down, right? So because you don't have the time. So basically, there's a collision detection mechanism in there, right? So if you have if you're talking a telephone line, of course you can talk at the same time. But um, if you look at the semantics of your communication, it will probably be pretty hard to figure out what you're actually talking about, right? Because you're polluting the uh, telephone line at the same time, right? Whereas if you do it sequentially in a kind of uh, systematic uh, simplex kind of interaction fashion, so one person talks at a time, it works. But here you have duplex communication, so if both channels transmit at the same time, you still be fine, right? You still transfer information. Only uh, yeah, one tag at a time, though, can be, be scanned. In RFID, you can identify multiple tags at the same time, interact potentially with. So the, you see that the bigger umbrella of this tag is much more complex and rich and you know, complicated as well. And here it's really narrowing it down to some practical use cases, because that's what you want, right? You, you want to deal specifically, intentionally, with one device or one uh, uh, transponder at, this, uh, at one time um, and have a very simple application case. That said, there's no security, right? So we don't have any security involved. And uh, what it's used for, um, so that's a typical uh, NFC uh, tag that you find, right? So it looks similar to one of the other antennas, but you see the extensive need for antenna to, to, to uh, allow the, um, the, the, the emergence of the electromagnetic field. And classical use cases on mobile devices, and more specifically, apart from the payment thing, of course, which is hotter, is also that kind of neat way of doing uh, bootstrapping communication, right? How do you ex how you pair devices? How do you share a secret key and things like this, right? Really cool, actually holding them together and they actually exchange the uh, um, you know pre-share key or the like for any sort of other more advanced encryption, and then you uh, following this one you switch it off and then just use the other communication mechanism to to establish um, the actual interaction, right? Um, you can of course also do simple data sharing, right? If you know this V card format. Um, it's a quite straightforward string that encodes your uh, contacts from your phone. It's also kind of uniform standard, but it would be an easy way of sharing that across devices because those are kind of simple uh, um, applications or, of course, ticketing and public transport, right? So you find this increasingly in different kind of Australia, I speak on that one, you, you kind of need to have um, this, this ticketing system or London as well. I think you need to have the mechanism to do this, Singapore, I believe, uh, also exclusively. So you can't buy paper-based tickets anymore at all. Um, so that's a practical use case, and you, of course you could use your smartphone for that purpose, but in practice you will of course have some sort of card provided with. So, yeah, so and then the neat part is, okay, we can actually uh, use that to some, to some um, extent. So uh, if we compare, just to get a feel, I didn't talk about Bluetooth, because it also fits in the category. In fact, Bluetooth is usually found a slightly higher level in the PAN area, personal area network. You know, because it also reaches up to 100 meters conventionally, right, in terms of, of uh, reach and interaction. Um, and it's still um, not centric to you only, but also uh, in involves potential interaction with your, you know, peers and stuff um, around you, which is not the case for NFC. But if you look at some of the points here, uh, how much would a tech cost that would be you Bluetooth that anyway? Well, you know, you're sitting at five bucks here, you're sitting at 10 cents, right? So it's a quite, a, quite a vast difference that uh, suggests that it's, you know, much more, um, practical actually to of course use it, right? So we have point-to-point um, -point communication, so one-to-one -one communication. Here we actually have a you know, sh shared network basically potentially amongst uh, individuals in a given range, range is limited and so on. And um, yeah, so the, the power consumption here is, uh, yeah, it varies vastly with Bluetooth, but considerably higher, but it's really, really low. In fact, Bluetooth is low energy, so um, gets close to that one. Um, the low energy profile would um, reach that as well. Okay, so bring it back to Android to some extent, so uh, because um, that's what we are kind of about a bit. But I think it's still worthwhile to talk about it, so you kind of put the um, terms in the right buckets, right? If you hear uh, NFC, RFID, is it, you know, what's the difference, and so on, right? So they belong together in a way. One of them is a subset of the other. So, okay, in Android, what can we do? Well. Classical use would be to uh, read and or write uh, NFC uh, devices with your phone, the classical uh, use that you would expect. Um, a second use case is to, uh, so here's kind of the phone as basically the reader. The second uh, case is um, interaction between two phones, so peer-to-peer. -peer. That would be uh, Android Beam, so uh, transmitting information from one device to another, like a string or whatever else. That's like the typical bootstrapping approach or contact sharing approach you find here. 
And you can also switch it around and say, hey, let's use the device actually and emulate smart cards. Right? Let the device itself not be the reader, but actually the passive, seemingly passive smart card itself. So it needs to emulate card behavior. Quite fun as well. Uh, yeah, that's kind of an advanced one that's really going d really down into nitty gritties because you need to understand the protocol in considerable depth to, to implement this. But we talk about it, uh, about some aspects here. So at the root of this entire uh, or the uh, interaction that is relevant for, for you in a wider sense as implementers potentially is the NFC data exchange format. At least some aspects of it are relative uh, importance. So the so called NDEF. Um, um, so that's that's uh, of course what we need to briefly um, need to talk about. And the rough operation would then be in very practice would be well you know you get this NDF so the NFC data exchange format from that tech and read and process it on a device right. So uh, Android Beam that's what I mentioned before and here we have the host they're called host based emulation the third case where um, the Android device basically um, uh, anytime it's activated by an external uh, um, uh, NFC source, it basically hands it to the host and lets you, your app, in, in this case in particular, emulate the card behavior by actually transmitting NDF packages back. Right. So that's the rough um, um, principle there. So uh, before we look at the protocol, I want to relate it to something you know. Um, if we talk about tra transfer protocols, they usually come in layers, right? And one of those, uh, sorry, not pro communication protocols, they come in layers. And one um, you actually know quite well, hopefully, is the ISO OC protocol. And that's where I hand over to you. My standard question, every lecture, I kind of, now every, every course, I try to fit it in, even if it doesn't fit at all. Uh, but in this case, it actually does. So what are the seven layers? Oh, I gave something away. Right. Anyone? What's the lowest one? Yep, and then? Data layer. Uh, yeah, more, more explicitly. Link. There you go. Data link. Data link, yeah, yeah. What's the next one? Networking layer. Okay, someone else, please. <laughs> I know you know your stuff. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> layer four, which is layer four? Transport layer. Okay, right, I'm coming back to you, it seems. Uh, and then, the last ones? Application layer. Yeah, a bit more refined. Yeah, but which order? The last three ones, please. Session. Yeah. Application. The session was good. And then what comes first? Presentation. Presentation is right. And then finally application, right? So that's the, the last three ones. In fact, I can't blame you at all because they're practically they're, they're conflated and practically uh, practically irrelevant. Most protocols actually conflate them anyway, right? So. The session initiation is often tied to the presentation and the transport, uh, the application level protocol. So that's fine. Um, that's right. So um, if we compare those two stacks, right? And here's the simplified one. That would be the kind of more TCP uh, IP kind of stack, right? So we have the physical layer. Okay, here spread out data link layer. They're usually conflated in the TCP IP model, um, and then we have the, the internet layer and the transport layer and application layer. And if you see, if you look on the left side here, that's NFC, it's vastly simpler, right? So we have the physical layer, of course. We have some sort of media access control um, um, and um, some logical link that deals with collisions. We talked about duplex ability, right? So it needs to be managed somewhere. So we have this functionality there as well. And then we have the application layer. Hang on. Wh why are we missing layers in between? Why do we get away with those few layers, so few layers? What do those layers do in the ISO OC um, model? The missing ones. Sorry? Yeah, but what's the, what's, what's the fundamental function of the internet uh, layer? IP? Yeah, what, uh, what do you, what, what's happening on the IP layer? Right on the internet protocol layer. What's happening fundamentally there? Which devices operate on that layer? From a network perspective. How, you know, how, how, how's, how's, what are the, 
devices uh, through which data is transmitted from one point to another endpoint. Exactly, routing happens there, right? So we, the dynamic routing and so on, are all those aspects are actually happen in the internet layer. Cool, what's happening on the transport layer, layer four? What does that mean? Correct, correct. That's basically kind of host-based routing, right? So it's kind of figuring out, okay, I figured out the host, now I just need to figure out which applications of those 64,000 potential applications or services is actually affected, right? So we have routing, so routing across the entire infrastructure, and we have the matching of applications. So if you don't see that on the left side, what does it tell you about NFC? That's right, but even more, more concrete, yes, it doesn't work on the internet, of course, that's right, um, but what does it tell you about NFC itself, about the features? Yeah, exactly, there is nothing like that, right? There's no routing concept, there is no multi-hop, you know, uh, routing across different devices or relaying information, and there's also no multi-services concept, on a particular host and or device, right? It's just packaged from here to here on a specific, uh, with a specific interface with a specific format, very simplistic. It says you so tells you something about the simplicity of the mechanism, right? So it really doesn't have that functionality, right? So that's quite, uh, uh, quite, quite, quite relevant. So, but it also tells you something about understanding the ISO-OC reference model because you can easily al allocate functionality with particular layers if you find another uh, related technology uh, that they're absent, you know that they will not have that corresponding functionality, right? So it's quite helpful. Of course, we need physical, we need some sort of coordination of some protocols, so base protocols for interaction, who speaks first, who speaks second, how do we deal with conflicts, that kind of stuff, right? Um, so uh, the collision detection, for example, Ethernet would be on this layer here as well. And then simply, well, you know, how do I get my string across from A to B, right? And this is the higher level up there. This is where basically this uh, NDF, this exchange protocol comes into play, which is fixed. And that's the thing that all of them speak or read, doesn't matter, but that's it, right? So it's no more magic uh, other than this one, right? So, and this is an NFC um, message as specified by the um, NFC forum, basically. It's a message consisting of multiple records and the records have corresponding headers, payloads, and the headers identifies the payload, specifically the identifies the payload uh, MIME type, right? So the uh, multimedia extensions type, is it text, is it a URL? You know, it basically just uh, provides that information. You guys know MIME types? MIME types, no? Text plane, application JSON, like those kind of things, right? The general type of, um, of, of, of uh, application that deals with this kind of thing and then more specific what it is, right? Application sound or something like this or um, I think application OGG would be one, right? So uh, it tells you something about generally it's an application that deals with this and what type of data you're actually dealing with. So, so in emails is basically how it's encoded. We can talk about this. Um, um, I actually can just bring them up for, for clarification purposes so we don't leave anyone behind here, hang on. So like, yeah, but on a super, of course on super naive uh, grounds, would find s something. Um, like this. So it basically says, well, you know, here um, if in this top example, so we, if we have text and this, um, basically the string or this data, this payload will contain text and this will be just be plain text. It will not be formatted according to UTF-8 or any other you know, uh, um, uh, advanced um, character set of formatting conventions or if it's just an application but we don't actually quite know what it contains, we say, well, application plus, well, it's a stream of octets, right? So um, quite, quite generic um, uh, specification or we know, for example, it's video well, that's good enough. Some video application takes the clear of this, but it's kind of it has this codec or this this um, you know string identifying the codec we're dealing with. Any application that can deal with this, please play this thing. Um, good luck, right? So all here we have an audio type, and AAC is the encoding, for example, right? So that's 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 what MIME times are. 
types are. So basically, it just uh, describes the nature of the payload. Yeah? And text plane is a typical one um, for that particular um, purpose. So. so it's quite a, a simple and straightforward um, um, protocol there. So um, well, using those cases, right? So what do we have? In Android, we have a so-called tech dispatch system. Um, so the idea is that the physical the device physically reads a tag or identifies a tag, and then it hands it off to this tag dispatch system that actually figures out which app will most likely be able to operate with this or on this, right? So, um, and it involves that basically analyzes the server tags and uh, looks particularly at the, at the uh, minor type and figures out, okay, does it, is that actually something I recognize that is standardized um, or um, that I know will be supported by the device, kind of Android specific, because they have support for you know selected minor types, right? So they can uh, display images. In principle, they can pass URLs. They can you know show text and things like this, right? Um, and of course, one message can in principle contain one or more of those records, right? So one uh, one message can contain multiple uh, strings to some extent, but oftentimes only first is, is used. And then what it does? Well, it puts this entire data into some sort of uh, in, into an intent. Uh, and just sends it to the system. And the neat part here, it comes back into our previous lecture uh, of, about intent filters. If your application has a registered intent filter, well, it get, will get that intent. So your role in your app will just be to interpret whatever you know, uh, NDF, so you need to know, to know that format to some extent, uh, will be sent to your uh, machine. Then you'll be able to you know, actually read um, NFC um, uh, information, right? So that's the, the rough structure here. So we have this. A kind of a type name. We have the um, indication as to whether the uh, record is, is, is well known or not. So it kind of differentiates um, between records that are well known and some that actually simply don't know. So uh, it will still send it to the to the actual uh, system and then try to find a corresponding app to um, operate on this. Um, but it will handle it slightly differently. So hang on, table. So you know, type name format, what is it? Is it a, a URI? Is it just empty? Uh, is it a some sort of external type, meaning it's kind of a URI, but I don't know what it is. I don't know the protocol, right? So uh, recall that the protocol structure is, uh, you know, kind of this way, uh, in a way that we know from more protocols. So protocol, um, some sort of other identifier, the domain name, and then the service, so, okay, for example. Is it a um, MIME type we know, right? So text plane, application, whatever. Or is it simply known, unknown, or um, if it's a well-known one, then you can refine it further in, further in the payload of the um, NDF here in the, um, yeah. So hang on, where am I? So, and that's how it works. So, right, so we have a, uh, if a tech is, um, tech, right, by your device, by the uh, NFC enabled device, it will either say, well, you know, we discovered something um, we actually know about, uh, a known MIME type or the like, so we actually kind of know the target application already ish. Um, and then if they are, if it, it, it will scan your phone, uh, the specifically the um, identified or um, intent filters, right? and figures out, okay, is there any app, any activity specifically on the device that will receive this intent, right? It goes through the intent filter and see, uh, checks if there's something like that registered. If no application is registered for that particular MIME type and so on, um, then it will fall back and look here into tech discovered. So that's the next lower level, basically, um, uh, in which the, ex the, the kind of the payload is not explicitly characterized but it's still a well-formed NDF message. It's just not sure what to do with this. Is it infrastructural information that's commit, uh, submitted here? Is it uh, custom um, information that's um, submitted from user? Or is it simply protocol-specific protocol data? Because there are different, yeah, of course, as in usual life, uh, certain sub-protocols um, um, that are available and that can be communicated using the um, using those kind of tags. So basically, if the mind type is not registered in the system, it downgrades, okay, am I not interested in the payload? Perhaps I'm interested in the technical information that's associated with the NFC tech in the widest sense. Um, it checks, well, is there anything registered that deals with this? 
okay if it's still not then it says well you know i found a tag good luck so you know like it just says well, whatever here is something I've, i'm done with you know figuring out whom i send it to i just um, send it to any intent that has uh, uh, listens to tag discovered basically so any intent filter that says oh whatever you know that's kind of the the, the uh, wildcard catch all intent filter if you have something NFC related, send it to me, please. That's the kind of uh, intent filter it's looking for, right? So it's getting from more specific to more general, right? So iterating through this uh, in this very fashion. So that's the Android approach of doing this. And practice is something like that. Well, you need permissions to read NFC, of course, right? You may or may not get them. Surprise, surprise. Um, here, um, of course, this information is pretty much this plain um, Android um, API specification. If you want to um, show, have an app that only shows up for phones that are NFC enabled, you kind of need to ensure that this, you put this in a manifest because it will guarantee that only phones that actually have NFC will um, be presented with your app, right? So if your app in here relies on NFC, there's no point showing it to anyone, so it's quite important. And the full feature set um, is only supported since uh, version 16, a subset of that since version 10, so Android 4.4, I think was the first word there, but um, so bear in mind that as well, but that's not a practical issue anymore um, and nowadays. But here is an example for the intent filters. So if you're now thinking about, I want to do NFC, pretty much the only thing or starting point of the nearly only thing you need to do is to create one of those, right? So you have an intent filter that is attached to your application component, like your activity in this case, right? Uh, and it basically identifies, okay, well, you know, I'm interested in getting information of any uh, NFC um, uh, tag that has been discovered. Um, this is the kind of the default category that needs to be specified everywhere. We'll recall that perhaps. And it also says something about the mind type you're listening on, or listening for, right? So if there's a tag discovered that corresponds, uh, has a, corres a, pay of, uh, sorry, a payload that corresponds to this mind type, then please send it. I will receive and deal with it. Yeah, if it's text. If it's URLs, slightly different here. So basically, it's just the only thing it changes is that instead of specifying the mind type, you specify a scheme. You basically say, well, you know, I want to um, uh, listen to those particular um, um, URLs that are related to uh, HTTP as a protocol, uh, a host, Android uh, developer, Android and com, and so on, and the suffix like this. Only those tags that have that payload is something I will receive. So basically, you can narrow it down, right, um, by, by being very specific about it. But you can also be quite um, um, creative in a wider sense and invent your own mind types. So if you have an NFC tag that you can program, and you can program it with your own mind type that you make up, basically, a string, right, that's fine as well. You can listen against those as well, right? So this way, you can actually have your own custom or propriety or whatever else uniquely, well, um, closed system in a wider sense, right, by, by no, well, Technically, close is relative because anyone who can read your system can, of course, read the mind type, so it's not secure, but it's close in the sense that most likely only your app will listen to the corresponding uh, text. So it's a good way of isolating from other, uh, from other NFC texts, right? So it's quite neatly, neatly solved in that particular context. Um, Right, so wh when it comes to the tech text, you recall they had this um, more advanced um, focus on text. The, the, the tech tags basically look at specific characteristics. We're just interested in NFC tags of one of those specifications. Then you can narrow it down on that level, right? So NFC A tags or B tags or F tags, basically there's always iterations and versions coming out that are slightly different in terms of the protocol and the encoding. And if you're interested in that, then you can you know, filter this as well. Um, so if you want to filter tech tags, you need to specify what you're interested in, in as a resource. So you need to have a resource specification that says that's the stuff I'm interested in. And then link that against an intent filter. So we have an intent filter with some um, um, uh, um, pointer to actual resource. So it's an XML um, formed resource and it has this particular name. So basically it points back to the original resource. Cool. Um, I think I give you a bit of a break um, because we're slightly over time already. So uh, let's say 20 past. Yeah. And then we're slowly switching over to networking. A few more words on NFC, um, and then I'll leave you in peace with this. I think it's still worthwhile learning or talking or hearing about this to some extent. Um, that's why I put it in.